Good evening and welcome to Newsnight. Tonight, as it emerges that National Security ordered an inquest last year into the school placement fraud, we ask what the recommendations are and why the Education Minister has refused to implement or make the findings public. Indeed, a committee was commissioned to investigate internally some of these issues that has been raised. The committee had finished their work. There were some recommendations that came up. They came up with some recommendations. Of course, some can be public. Some I cannot say them here because of how classified the document is. We have details as a member of the Education Committee demands that the findings are made public. It comes as a surprise to many of us. I find it very strange that in spite of that committee's work, we have not heard publicly persons who have made it a habit uh, to profit from a system that is supposed to ensure fairness and equity being held accountable. We'll also hear calls for an abolishment of the protocol system in the computerized school selection and placement system to read the system of perennial fraud window for the human we say we are doing a computerized placement system let it be computerized also in today's edition of ghana school of shame why have many schools in the Krachin chumuru district not received the required number of textbooks for implementation of the new curriculum that kick-started in 2019 there have not been textbooks but i won't say adequate there's none also tonight, managers of defaulting companies in Ghana Revenue Authority's latest tax invasion crackdown face five-year jail term or even worse, should they be found guilty. We have business. And let me be getting you more details on industrial response to this proposed extension of the domestic debt exchange program. And in sports, a FIFA transfer ban looms for Ghana Premier League side Midyama over debt. Old former Ivorian striker Ahmed Toure will bring you details shortly. And also later, National Tenants Union of Ghana urges government to ensure fairness as the National Rental Assistance Scheme is launched to aid individuals pay for their rent. Application processes to assess the scheme by the people be transparent. Well, there's an assurance from government that it will be free from political interference. You are inevitably going to have no political interference because if they give a loan to somebody who... Details of that and more here on Newsnight. Please do all to join us with your thoughts and comments. It's via WhatsApp 055 I am MFA Apau. And my name is Evan Spencer. We start tonight uh, from that developing story since yesterday about the corruption in the school uh, placement system. And it is emerging that the Ministry of National Security last year ordered an inquest into the perennial fraud in the school placement system it is however unclear why the minister of education to whom the findings were to have been submitted is yet to implement the findings or make the findings public even though he has been uh, commenting on the latest fourth estate documentary which led to the arrest of eight persons uh, for extorting up to 20,000 CDs from parents and guardians to place the awards in category A schools. MFA, uh, we secured a copy uh, of this, uh, of, of this uh, committee's document that spelled out the terms and conditions and the membership and what should happen once investigations uh, are done. Um, what, what did we learn? Where, where, how, how did the education ministry come to set up this committee? Okay, so we've secured a copy of that particular letter ordering the setting up of that committee to start this particular inquest. I'll go through it verbatim. This is dated on 21st of June 2022. And this is a letter signed by the acting chief director for the ministry, Define Ayujo. Uh, that's his name. And it says that uh, alleged corruption at Computer Selection Placement Center impeding placement process composition of five member investigative committee so it says i refer to a correspondence on the above subject matter from the national security minister with reference number it gives that reference number and that's dated 8th of april 2022 and it's referred to me and the special assistant to the honorable minister of education so by the strength of this referral we hereby respectfully constitute this five member investigative committee made up of the following persons to go into this matter 
for the attention of government through the National Security Minister, Honorable Albert Kandapa. He names the members as Mr. Edward Fiaoife, who is the chairperson and convener of the National Internal Audit Ministry of Education. They also have Mrs. Matilda Ewia Azuma. He's also a head of legal at the Ministry of Education. Mr. David Pra, who is the Deputy Director General TVET Service. Mr. Bafwe Ewia, who is the de- Director pre tertiary Ministry of Education. He also has Cynthia, Mrs. Cynthia Stoff Tego, who is the Head Legal, Ghana Education Service, and Mr. Patrick Arthur, who is the Principal Planning Officer, was a Secretary to the Committee. So that's the composition of that particular committee that was set up back then. This is in June 2022. And furthermore, the terms of reference of this committee shall include the following. So these are the terms of reference for this particular committee before they commence to work. One is to investigate into the allegations of corruption at the CSSPS during the 2022 senior high school placement period of basic education certificate examination candidates into first year of senior high school. The second terms of reference is to submit its findings and recommendations to the Ministry of Education for onward submission to the National Security Ministry for necessary action to be taken. Then also to ascertain on any other matter relevant to the issues that may be related to the subject matter, if any. And then it concludes by saying that you are respectfully requested to commence work immediately. That was on the 22nd of June. And submit your report through the undersigned for onward submission to the appropriate quarters by close of work on Friday, 29th July, 2022. So this is the letter uh, that um, set up that particular committee that it's now emerging. This is a committee and the findings and the recommendations that we didn't know about until yesterday uh, when mm. we started uh, talking so, about this. So when they were done, they were supposed to give it to the education minister? Yes, they were supposed to take then... it through the acting chief director to the education minister for onward transfer because we know that the national security minister is at his instance that this particular committee was put together. But as it stands now, uh, we've been getting some confirmation from the PRO of the Education Ministry, Chrissy Kwating, who was with you on Mm -hmm. PM Express last night, admitting for the first time that there was any such committee and their report as well. I have just spoken with the uh, Chief Director of the Ministry who happens to be the the, the writer of, of the letter, the said letter. And then the feedback that I have is that indeed a committee uh, was commissioned to investigate internally. Uh, I mean, the issue, some, some of these issues that has been raised, because like I indicated, this is the first time we are witnessing such uh, challenges within the placement space. Uh, the committee had finished their work. There were some recommendations that came up, but of course the committee was not working in isolation. They were also working uh, in collaboration with other state institutions, because I mean, even if you look at Manasseh's video, for instance, there was some element of criminality in it, I mean, allegedly, because some people were arrested. So at some point, the committee was working with the police. The committee had to work with the national security. The community had, the committee had to work with the Ghana Education Service and even the Ministry of Education themselves. They came up with some recommendations. Of course, some can be public. Some I cannot share them here because of uh, the nature of how classified the document is, but I'm sure. I mean, some of the, the recommendations are quite interesting, and, and it, it points to what Manasa was saying, that indeed you could have some people that probably have been aiding the process. But I mean, Chris, we're all asking the same question, did this happen? So we've answered the first one, which is that the committee was actually set up and they yeah. did the work. Yeah, they did the work. Yeah. So the committee- The report is actually ready. Ready. Yeah. I mean, so the, the committee gave a specific timeline on the 9th July 2022, were the findings given to the Minister of Education? Yeah, the findings were obviously given, but I mean, you know how committees do work, especially when I've explained that they were not working in isolation. At some point, they had to rely on certain information coming from other uh, state agencies. So obviously, they went beyond the time that the committee was supposed to work with them. So it took quite some okay. time. Six months yeah, now, Yes, right? yes. I so mean, the July 2nd was supposed to be the deadline um, so the minister definitely, before the commencement of this year, has this report. Obviously, obviously. Okay. Yeah. It begs the question, has it been forwarded to the National Security Minister and what the Minister of Education himself, who I guess precise about the challenge, what has he done about it till now? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, that there, there, there were some recommendations from the, from the committee. And uh, of course, some of the recommendations borders internally. 
the decisions that they made, the Minister for Education himself must take. There were other decisions that also had to, uh, you have to rely on other institutions like national security, the police, and what have you. Uh, GS also had their role to play. Uh, but, I mean, the point is that the report is ready. The Minister for Education have the report. Uh, and all consequential decisions within the report will be communicated, like I indicated. But has yeah. he implemented any of it? It's been six months, close to six months, uh, since the yeah, work was apparently yeah, done. Yeah, the, the, the work was not done within the time frame. So there was because, some, so they elapsed the time a bit. Yeah, exactly, because I earlier on explained that they had to rely on other state institutions with regards to certain information that they needed. So the report was not finished, I mean, within that six months that we may want to calculate. Mm. But I can confirm, at least for now, that the Minister for Education, the report has been ready. So that's uh, the PR of uh, the Education Ministry, Evan, say, giving you uh, those details. Did he give you in any indication as to what some of the recommendations were? I saw that you were trying to push, asking no, I mean, what the recommendations were. He, he confirms that he literally learnt about the existence of this first of all the letter that you read and this committee just when the show had started um and to be fair to him as he indicated he had to leave to make a call uh spend about 20 minutes while the show was going on to try and find out what was happening um so to, to be, he, he was in the position to know the details mm. um he had been told it existed recommendations had been done and minister has it he doesn't know what has happened to it. Mm. He doesn't know if it's been implemented or not. Um, he, he can't tell if the uh, National Security Minister has received it or not. Um, all he knew was that it was done. Minister has it, and there were recommendations that had to be implemented. You, you heard me mm. ask him, so has he implemented any? And his, his, his answer, and what he said, uh, everybody had his, his answer to that. So, so that's where we are on that particular but, but subject. But the key question also, I saw that uh, you were trying to get that response from the, the PRO, was why the education minister at no point gave any indication that any such committee had been put together, especially in his interview with Manasseh or the fourth estate during that investigation. You, you, you're right. I mean, so that, that was the obvious curiosity because it, it minister did not only speak to Manasseh, he was also on GTV mm -hmm. um, after the after he got to know about the documentary, and he's spoken he's spoken extensively about the problem, the corruption, the system. Mm -hmm. Never once in all that conversation did he mention that. Look, we've done some Work internal investigations uh, because my colleague, National Security Minister, was was concerned about it, and we have recommendations, and we are implementing. Or about to implement never once mentions it mm. uh and so for in fact his own spokesperson who has been speaking on the issue also didn't know that they've done some work um until he found out yesterday uh, so so that is obvious one of the obvious curious questions and clement park who was on the show mm -hmm. yesterday um you know made that point uh, about he was also surprised and he said he found it curious and strange that the minister did not volunteer to Manasseh or to GTV when he spoke to them that we've done this work, we've already investigated this matter and we are doing something about it. It comes as a surprise to many of us that uh, an investigative committee was set up to look at this matter internally. On the face of it, that ought to be something positive. But I find it very strange that in spite of that committee's work, we have not heard publicly with regards to the outcome of the work of the committee and whether or not persons who have made it a habit uh, to profit from a system that is supposed to ensure fairness and equity being held accountable. So once we don't have any evidence to show that the work of the committee has led to the apprehension or has led to the uncovering of those who have been perpetrating this deed, I still have a lot of reservations about what we have been told so far. And I equally find it uh, rather strange uh, that in spite of the engagement between uh, Manasseh and, and the minister, the minister could not voluntarily on his own have indicated that indeed the committee had done his work and that he had seen a copy of the report 
albeit the letter indicating that the outcome of the committee's work was supposed to go back to the national security minister. So I think uh, this revelation about the committee and its work actually raises a lot more questions than it proffers answers. Well, we'll be hearing from the ranking member on that committee as well. Maybe he has more information than, than we know. But uh, Peter Anti, and uh, he was on the show as well. He's with IFES. He's questioning why the status quo remains in the face of the quantum of evidence that points to the fraud in the system. Because the commitment is not there. And, and that is why I, I feel sad, because we seem to be downplaying this particular challenge. The fact that the challenge has been there over the years, and we know, as we are all claiming now, that we have this challenge of people abusing the system and we have not taken steps to track these people. And within the, the, the ministry, there were attempts to investigate who those people behind this system were. And outside the ministry and in the Ghana Education Service, attempts were made to do investigative or to undertake investigative processes to bring out those who are involved in this, to stop this. And, and, and that is what saddens me. Because we cannot say that we have been with this for all this while. So, of course, let's, let's look at it as it is. No, we need, we need to, one, accept that we have to stop this at a point in time. And this is a perfect opportunity that has presented itself for us to speak about this and push that the needed measures are put in place to ensure that we bring this particular problem to its barest minimum because okay. people are really benefiting from it yeah people i mean and, really... and, and and let's 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 go on that uh, with uh, dr um well, so that's um, Peter Anti uh, Pati on uh, PM Express last night. We also had Africa Education Watch also on the show, uh, raising concerns about making um, the findings public. Uh, let's head to Parliament now. And the ranking member on Parliament Education Committee, Peter Nochukotoy, joins us live. We are grateful for your time here on News Night Says. So help us understand. I don't know if at any point in time during your dealings with the Education Ministry, it was ever known to your committee as a ranking member that there was any such findings and whether the recommendations have been made available to you as well. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, good evening to you and uh, your team. Yeah, in actual fact, these uh, allegations of uh, extorting money from uh, parents before um, admission was given or placement was done last year came to our notice as a, a committee. And uh, uh, what we did was uh, myself and the chairman met with uh, the Minister for Education to inform him of uh, the misgivings of uh, members of parliament and the public that uh, money was being uh, uh, extorted from uh, parents before placement uh, was being done. And it was there that he told us that the Director General had written to the state uh, security agencies for investigations to be conducted. Uh, well, he dismissed it as a rumor that he said that uh, because we don't have any evidence, nobody has come to us with uh, evidence that I pay so so amount. But you should know that for every rumor, there's some element of uh, truth in it. So if that was going on, we came there specifically to inform him to put his uh, feet on the ground and then make sure that uh, those who were involved were either removed from the system or he did something better so that uh, we will forestall any such uh, occurrences again. He gave us the assurance that the security agencies were going to investigate and that he believed that uh, there was nothing of uh, that nature. So that was where we ended it. Uh, for the internal committee that they set up at the ministry, as a committee, we were not aware. I also heard it for the first time yesterday during your uh, express, uh, 9 p.m. express program yesterday. Hmm. Well, but going forward then, uh, because um, they, we've seen or sort of heard some calls uh, for those recommendations to be made public and as to why uh, since last year, we know they were supposed to, uh, you know, make that uh, report available to the minister by July of 2022. And as it stands now, we are now hearing that the, the, about the existence of this report in the first place. Is it something that you're going to push for to make um, these recommendations public? 
Yes, having watched your program yesterday and others uh, since uh, uh, Monday or that of yesterday, the chairman and myself uh, we decided that we should call the minister to appear before the committee on Thursday. So I am very much aware that the, the chairman of the committee gave instructions to the uh, clerk to the committee to summon the minister before the committee on Thursday. So tomorrow we will find out if the correspondence has got to the office of the minister and what his response is, because uh, this is a very grievous uh, matter which uh, needs a special uh, attention so that uh, we can stop it even before the commencement of the placement for this year. We are grateful. This is an issue we'll follow up on. That's Peter Nochikoto, is a ranking member of the Education Committee of Parliament. Yeah, one of the things that also came up yesterday on PM Express, the, um, the spokesperson for the ministry uh, made a point that one of the biggest challenges they have is with the protocol system. Mm -hmm. And that's where he believes the corruption happens. Uh, we've been hearing from former Deputy Education, Education Minister, Minister. Uh, Samuel Kujita Blakwa, who says the protocol system must be abolished. There is absolutely no reason why this should happen. When we were at the ministry, we announced no protocol, and Professor Nana Jopokwajima was very, very passionate about that. When you create protocol systems, that is what it leads to. We must abolish protocol, let everything be based on merit, remove the you know, discretion, the uh, window for the human. We say we are doing a computerized placement system. Let it be computerized. Well, so that's a uh, former Deputy Education Minister, Noftong MP, um, Samuel Okujetua Blackwa, they're speaking on the AM show earlier today. We'll stay a while longer on education. Mm -hmm. Because the Ghana Education uh, uh, Service introduced a new curriculum in 2019, but to date, uh, many schools are yet to receive the required number of test books in December. Uh, 2022, many schools in the Krachin Chumuru district had not received the textbooks for the new curriculum. In today's edition of Ghana's Schools of Shame, uh, Johnny's uh, Features Editor Jojo Kobana checked uh, over 20 schools in the district and found that teachers have received textbooks for only three subjects from basic one to six. In September 2019, a new standard based curriculum will be rolled out from kindergarten to class six in primary schools. This curriculum is drawn upon the best practices from all over the world and will focus on making Ghanaian children confident, innovative, creative thinking, digitally literate, well-rounded patriotic citizens. That statement was made on 20th February 2019, three years after the introduction of the new curriculum Many basic schools operated without textbooks. Many education stakeholders expressed concerns about no textbooks in the classrooms. The education minister, Dr. Yao Osei Educhum, was compelled to answer questions in parliament on why the textbooks had delayed. We're going to do everything possible to make sure the textbooks are there. That is why this time I was careful not to give you a date because I know my colleague will come and quote me. But all that I can assure you of is that we are at a critical stage where the quality assurance is being done. In July 2022, the government printed and supplied textbooks to schools. My colleague, Papani Ashali, met the Deputy Education Minister, Reverend Intim Fodjo, and asked when all schools will receive the textbooks. The speed that we are seeing it now, and we are very optimistic that even before the 90 day period, every school and every child will have the required number of books to support their effective learning. So we focus on the Krachi and Chimuri districts of the OT region. Many teachers found innovative ways of impacting knowledge because they had not received textbooks. My name is James Asari Udia and this Motoka number 2 DA Primary Basic 4. Um, I'm the one in charge of this class. There have not been textbooks, in fact, I won't say adequate. There's none. So what we do is, you have to go around, when you get a passage, you have to run photocopy of it. You bring it for lesson. As of December 2022, many schools had not received textbooks. The issue is that we don't have textbooks. So some of us use our own money to buy it like this RME. I bought it with my own money. Science with my own money. 
and the one that I can afford is what I bought. We lack books. Subjects that we don't have books, we have we lack math books, we lack science books, we lack social uh, and other people, we lack history. In fact, basically, we lack all books. I'm Benny Stogbe, a class a class three teacher, and this is our class about the textbooks. We don't even have a single of them. That's the new curriculum textbook. So um, I bought a golden a textbook, that golden English, golden Sahara, they, they, it's drawn like according to the new curriculum. So that is what I am using small, small. I just bought single, single of them. Dodge Kope DA Primary School had also not received textbooks. You just go online, Google about the subject, uh -huh. you do your own research and come in. You don't have textbooks, so you just go online and Google about the subject, then you come and teach just like that. Brian Quanta had some textbooks for some classes. The textbook we have, only few. Uh, looking, looking at the number of the children, each child will not get a textbook. At least four in one. Four children per one book. And those children cannot carry the book home. In Desala DA Primary School also had not received textbooks. So how will these children be confident, creative, digitally literate and well-rounded citizens as stated by the president when they do not have learning aids. This is just one side of the story. Uh, schools under trees is, is a symptom of poor planning. Why did we not know that that community needs a school and proactively put a school there and just go and approve a school that is under tree? When you were sending the teachers there, didn't we see there were no classrooms? So it's an indictment against us, and we are going to do a better job next time not to look at the symptoms, but to really approach the challenge, the problem. Children here study under very terrible conditions. The district chief executive of Krachi in Chimuru, in Kwesi, acknowledges that his district has serious infrastructure challenges. The infrastructure deficit is huge. We have a lot of deplorable uh, schools. We have high number of schools under trees too. Uh, then furniture deficits at the last time when I checked, I requested for that data from the district assembly. We have over 7,000 uh, 7, deficits. So we have over 7,000 children who don't have any furniture to sit on. So that is about half of the student population in the district. So that's the Krachi in Chumuru story. And we're told that now they have about, what, three uh, textbooks. They've received textbooks for only three subjects from basic one to six. Let's look at the national situation. We're yet to hear from the Education Ministry uh, on why public schools have not received the required number of textbooks uh, for that particular curriculum. And we have Reverend Ouzo, um, Isaac Ousu, is the NAT president, joining us live. We're grateful for your time here on News Nights. So paint a picture to us about what the national situation is when it comes to these textbooks for the new curriculum well let me first thank you for the opportunity let me say very good evening to your cherished listeners this evening uh from what the teachers said in the in the in the audio you just played that is the fact uh so far three subjects that is creative arts integrated science and English language. These are the three textbooks that the Ghana Education Service last year uh, supplied to the regions for always submission to the schools. And even those ones, uh, you could see that when the books get to the region, the various district directorates are supposed to go for the books. And you could see that some of them are even here to start the distribution. And that is the challenge. The, the, the textbooks has already delayed. You know, last year on this same platform, your colleague Evans interviewed myself and the publishing company, their president, when the minister gave them 120 days to complete 
the publication of the textbooks for our submission. So if uh, the whole of last year, publishers were given 120 days by the minister, and we have started new academic year, and it is only three textbooks that have gone to the schools. It is, it is a big worry. It's a big worry. So that is, a, that is, that is a, the, the, the situation now, my sister. Well, well, that's interesting. But as teachers, I'm sure that you've been trying to find some answers, especially from the Education Ministry and the Ghana Education Service. Do we have any reason for this in the first place? Uh, I'm unable to give any tangible reason unless you get to the ministry or the GS themselves. Mm. So then how are we coping? Because if we have three, just three subjects, how are we teaching our children in these schools? Yeah, so what the teachers are doing is to make good use of the uh, uh, internet to search for information. Parents that can afford uh, textbooks go to the market to buy from those that uh, they are selling. But how many parents can afford textbooks to this to these kids? Well, in schools like Krachi and Shimuru that we've been talking about, where there may be no internet, what then do teachers do? Yes, you see, the, 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 the teachers do everything possible to make sure that they get access to information. So sometimes, some of them have to even travel after school, they have to travel back to uh, a nearby towns and cities where they can get access to uh, uh, internet. And, and, and that is an additional cost to the teachers. Well, Rev, we're grateful. That's uh, Rev. Kaizi Kowusu, is the NAT president. And these are questions that we are still finding answers for. And definitely we'll get to the bottom of this. And this is uh, what third part of our Schools of Shame series uh, put together by Joy News Features editor Jojo Kobna. We're still checking to find out when exactly all the textbooks will be provided as part of this new curriculum implementation. You still will listen to News Night is on Joy 99.7 FM. Joy Jaffe is here with the very latest on the world of business. Hello, mm -hmm. George. George is a happy David Obon uh, No, no I, you're yeah, not okay. I, 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 oh, think, okay. I think it's still early days here. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, you still want more scrutiny to still get better understanding of what government is offering. And that's some yeah. will say that it still may yeah. be good to engage your independent and, and, and you know that what is instructive we spoke to three very influential individuals in the space former head of sec mm. dr edward and he says do he will do well accept it an interested uh, party <laughs> exactly an interested party that's truth martin Pebu says the same an and then professor Bo Bo yeah. who says he didn't have independent any, uh, he, didn't, person. He, he didn't have any yeah. uh, horse yeah. in the race yeah he also says no he won't accept it mm -hmm. i mean so that there, there is there's some further clarity that we need on this what more do you have in the headlines and if I'm, we'll be looking at the fact that individual bondholders up until february 7 to sign up or to reject government uh, proposed or new domestic debt exchange program that it will be offering uh, to them we're getting you more details on them we'll also be bringing you uh, some independent analysis on this particular issue with respect to this and what would this also mean for ghana's uh, program with the imf uh, we're getting more details on the one the business news on news night is brought to you by mtn business welcome to the new world of business alliance life and ghana pay welcome back to business on Newsnight. Now, individual bondholders now have up to February 7 to sign up or reject the domestic debt exchange program that government is presenting to them. Now, this was after the finance ministry announced an extension of the program after it expired today. Here's more in the business text report. The finance ministry in a statement argued that individual bondholders have the option not to participate in the offer. However, the finance ministry was quick to add that, upon successful completion of the domestic debt exchange program, the old bonds that individuals are holding right now will be difficult to trade. The finance ministry was, however, quick to add that individual bondholders below 59 years will be offered instruments with a maximum maturity of 5 years instead of the 12 years and a coupon rate of 10 years. The finance ministry in the statement also maintained that all retirees, including those that retire in this year, will be offered an instrument with a maximum maturity of five years and a coupon payment of 15 years. Government also announced that 
Discussion are being finalized with various interests like the organized labor as well as the pensioners. That is the business deck support. Meanwhile, we'll be getting the thoughts, or we have gotten the thoughts of Professor Lord Mensah. He's a finance lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School on what he makes of what government has presented, the terms being offered to individual bondholders, and also concerns being expressed. Yeah, I think uh, for now, government has moved away from the all size fit all approach, and now they're trying to turn to the various individual you know bondholders and then how they can meet their expectations yeah with the proposed structure of the um, individual bonds that government is giving out i think um it's about time the individual bondholders do what we call horizon analysis get to know the cumulative bonds that they were due to um, as far as the old bonds are concerned and the new one that government is proposing which is five years with 10% for those who are less than, you know, 59 years. I think they should compare the two, and if cumulatively um, it can meet up their expectations, they should be able to, you know, accept the offer on the table. I will not um, advise a complete opt-out, because uh, once uh, the government finishes the DDAP, all the various interest structures in the economy are going to pick up in that direction. And so um, the um, tradability of the air bonds that they are holding will become a problem. And uh, I think our advice, after going through that comparative analysis, I've advised, and effectively the cumulative um, coupons that they're supposed to have together with their principal can meet up with the new offer structures, they should go for it. And that is the finance lecture at the University of Ghana Business School. That is Professor Lord Mensah sharing his thoughts on what you have to do and what this will mean to individual bondholders. Earlier on, the finance minister has been talking about how closing this engagement will mean for Ghana getting the program approved with the IMF board in March this year to get the necessary disbursement to support the economy. Let's listen to the finance minister, Ken Oforiata. Uh, we have a deadline of end of February um, for the Paris Club, and so we need to be able to do that. And in between there, we would have completed our domestic exchange program, and therefore to be able to go to board uh, in March uh, for this to be executed. So we are looking somewhere in March, rather. Right, that that's the, that's correct. The From the well. plan, that's correct. Are we sure of uh, getting everything needed to get the board approved? We joined the fund program in July. And the president said that we should do our SLA by end of end of the year. And it looked impossible because it really hadn't been done before. And um, between the fund and, uh, and, and the Ghanaian government, uh, we worked hard and um, we were able to do that. So it is that same spirit that we are working. And uh, I expect that we'll be able to do that. And that is Finance Minister Ken Oferreta earlier speaking to us on what this will mean in terms of closing the deal with these individual bondholders and all the interested parties in getting an IMF program approved for Ghana. A five-year jail term, that is what managers of the companies evading tax will face if they are caught. The Ghana Revenue Authority in its latest crackdown has arrested managers of the East Legon branch of Maxma Shopping Center, Community 25 branch of Palace Shopping Mall, and Second Cup Coffee Shop at Jolo for non-compliance with the tax laws and bypassing the electronic VAT invoicing system. The two experts in the Ghanaian manager of these three companies will be prosecuted. The tax team lead, Joseph Annan, indicates that the exercise continues. Looking at a combination of sections of our law, we have uh, our uh, DAT Act of 2013. Uh, we have sections 58, 59, and then the REE, the Revenue Administration Act. And when you are looking at a maximum of 1,500 penalty units, that is the maximum you could do. That is if there was no assessment to it. And then we are also looking at an imprisonment not more than five years or a combination of both. But then if we are able to establish the taxes payable, then the penalty will be three times that, you know, assessment. And that is the tax for team lead uh, with the Ghana Revenue Authority, Joseph Annan. And that's all for business on Newsnight. Back to you, Evans. Uh, George, thank you very much. Uh, PM Express is the place to be uh, tonight. You don't want to miss the, the domestic debt exchange yes, program. Yes, yes, yes. It's going to be 
the domestic digestion program. And uh, it, based on the offer on the table, we are asking a simple question. The debt exchange final offer. Deal or no deal? Mm. It's mm. a simple question. Mm. Mm. Deal or no deal? Yeah. And we're going to have Martin Kwebu, Senior Hossi, Dr. Duan Anri-Chi, uh, Professor Godfrey Bopwing. And we're also trying to get the a sense from the uh, trustees. Yeah. You know, yeah. They've, yeah. they've now been yeah. invited to the table yeah. you, know, yeah. you know, to try and talk. And I want to get clarity. And also, don't forget the securities for. industry as well. You know, yeah, they yeah, were exactly, pushing exactly, that exactly. no yeah. exemption for anyone. Yeah. Exactly. So, so it's going to be an interesting conversation at 9 p.m. You want to join us uh, for that uh, live here. On, uh, on the Joe News channel, on our social media platforms. go Just go on to Facebook, onto our YouTube page, and, and look for Joe News there and watch it from 9 p.m. Now, an Accra High Court is urging the police service to reach out, to reach an, an out-of-court settlement with journalist, uh, my colleague, Latif Idrisu. Now, Justice Cynthia Redu gave this advice following a passionate plea by the Attorney General for the case to be put on hold. The police service and the Attorney General have been sued by a multimedia and of course my colleague Latif Idrisu uh, following the brutal assault of, uh, of, of, of Latif by a policeman in 2018. Court correspondent Joseph Akablay has the rest of the story. The Attorney General had on Monday told the court the police service had been urged to pursue settlement as an option. During cross-examination of Latif Idrisu, however, an attorney at the AG's office had insisted a journalist was not assaulted by any policeman. Mr. Idrisu dismissed the claim and maintained he was beaten by many policemen. Right, so I feel the pains in my head because that's where they used the butt of the gun to hit and my rib and in my right leg and my chest. Well, they hit your chest too? Yeah, they were hitting me all over. So. These are the areas you feel pain, but generally, how are you feeling? My neck as well, yeah, because of the slaps, you know. On Tuesday, the attorney, Nancy Rita Chumesi Esiyama, told the court she had been instructed to plead for an adjournment while settlement talks are pursued. Justice Redu pointed out the case could progress while an attempt is made to reach an agreement. The attorney pleaded for the case to be put on hold. Lawyer for the journalist and the multimedia group, Samson Ladi Anyenini, told the court his side was not opposed to the idea of settlement. His concern was, however, the fact that the case had been unduly delayed. Justice Redu urged both sides to pursue the settlement talks without taking an entrenched position. Mr. Anyenini pointed out at this stage that certain comments made by the police were problematic. He made specific reference to court documents in which the police had claimed the assaulted journalist was not suffering from any medical complication. Justice Redu advised the police to consider getting an independent examiner if necessary. She stressed that settlement is always the best approach. The case has been adjourned to March 16, 2023. The court is to be briefed on the progress of the settlement talks. Well, let's stay a while longer in the courts, this time in Tamale, because counsel for the four-person standing trial for procurement breaches at the National Development Authority are pushing for an expeditious trial after a Tamale High Court granted them a two million CD bill. CEO Sumaila Abdul Rahman, two of his deputies, Stephen Yeri Eru Engman and Patrick Seidu, and CEO of ANQ Consortium Andrew Kundari, pleaded not guilty to six counts, including conspiracy to commit crime, directly and indirectly influencing the procurement process to obtain an unfair advantage advantage of award of a contract. We can hear from their lawyer, Joseph Dindyok Bemka. We're here to, for them to take their plea and then to read out the facts and for us to make applications for bail. Uh, it was a very friendly atmosphere. The special prosecutor's office was represented by the deputy and different lawyers represented the different clients. That's the four accused persons. So as we are very much aware in open court, when the charges were read, there were six charges leveled against the four persons. And when the charges were read, all of them pleaded not guilty. And so everything has fallen into issue for trial to determine their guilt or otherwise. Now, having read the charges and having pleaded not guilty, and again the facts have been read, and the court gave us the opportunity to make a submission for a bill, which the lawyers agreed as we do so on their behalf. And I beg. And the court duly granted them bail. The bail was not opposed by the Office of Special Prosecutor. And you are aware that they granted them bail. Each of them 500,000 dollars in three shortages to justify. And then they should deposit their passport. The case has been again to 28 for case management and thereafter the death. That's uh, former uh, Deputy Attorney General Joseph Denjok Memka there.
Well, the National Tenants Union of Ghana uh, is urging government to be fair in a selection of persons who qualify to be assisted with their rent advance as government launches the National Rental Assistance Scheme to aid individuals pay their rent. Under this scheme, individuals will be given sub loans to pay their rent advance. Uh, General Secretary of the Union, Frederick Opoku, says there must be equity. We'll hear from him shortly, but first, Minister for Works and Housing, Aysen Sobwache, says the scheme is expected to cushion thousands who struggle to find the money to pay their rent advance. Therefore, made a commitment of 30 million Ghana cities to implement this scheme. And the initial phase will cover the Greater Accra, Ashanti, Northern, Western, Eastern, and Bono East regions. These six regions were selected because data from rent control indicates that they have a higher rate of rent advance related issues. No mechanism by which eligible households, including the youth, can be supported to access decent rental accommodation and to effectively protect them from undue exploitation. Now we can hear from the General Secretary of the National Tenants Union of Ghana, Frederick Opoku, who is urging the managers of the scheme to be fair. In this regard, we recommend that the government establish a statutory body called the National Rental Housing Task Force Group to protect the scheme and support the enforcement of rent advance payments not exceeding one year when the rent bill, which is now in Parliament, is passed into law. Your Excellency, we take this opportunity to also thank you for the government facilitating to see the rental assistant, uh, rental housing authority, and by extension, the rental um, uh, uh, housing um, acts, which is very, very prime to we tenants in this country. Mm -hmm. We therefore caution that the application processes to assess the scheme by the people be transparent, fair, credible, with no political callous, where all qualified applicants under the scheme would have equal opportunity to benefit. Well, uh, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya uh, says mechanisms have been put in place to ensure the scheme is free from political interference. And that is how it has been done. And because the management of the scheme is being outsourced to the private sector, you are inevitably going to have no political interference because if they give a loan to somebody who is not eligible, they will lose money. And so if somebody comes to tell you that I am this party or that party, so give me my, a, a loan and I don't qualify, uh, they will be uh, essentially hurting themselves if they provide that loan to somebody who cannot repay the loan. So I think there's an inbuilt uh, mechanism to, to stop um, political interference in the operationalization of the schemes. Well, we can hear from the Secretary General of the Trade Union Congress, Dr. Yaoba, admonishing managers of the scheme to prioritize single mothers. I also want to appeal to the ministry and all those who assess the applications. Let's prioritize women, especially um, mothers with children, without husbands, the single mothers. You see, if you provide accommodation to one single mother who has two children, it's much better than providing accommodation for others who have no children. Well said. That's the, the TUC Secretary General, Dr. Yaoba. Um, when a conflicted uh, broadcaster talks about <laughs> issues like that, you know. Where's Val? Yes, even. Are well. you smiling broadly? Ah, uh, well, there's a lot that's happening, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> 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 Anyway, what's, what's happening on the transfer deadline? It's, it's, well, yes, uh, we're going to bring you up to speed on that. But uh, just before that, there's trouble for Midiama SC because World Football Governing Body FIFA has ordered them to pay former player Ahmed Toure over 100,000 Ghana cities for breach of contract. That's uh, what Joyce was. I've got a pair, a FIFA document available to us, uh, which was released by so judge uh, Dana Al Naomi there. Now, according to the issue, Midiama are uh, requested to make complete full payment within 45 days of face sanctions from registering players locally and internationally. We understand that uh, Ahmed Toure, who joined Midiama in February 2021, uh, was suspended for a week and fined 1,500 Ghana cities for alleged gross indiscipline towards coach at the time, 
Omar Rabi. Uh, he appealed the decision at FIFA and subsequently got the verdict in his favor. And Midiama within 45 days need to make this payment or face the sanction. In terms of the transfer, it's Kamal Dean who is of interest now and he's very close to joining English Premier League side Southampton. We understand that uh, he's undergone medicals and will soon be unveiled before the transfer deadline closes tonight. And in the Chan tournament, Algeria uh, host nation, they're the ones who have defeated Niger by five goals to zero to make it to the finals of the tournament. And even what's interesting is this same Niger side mm -hmm. are the ones who defeated Ghana by two goals to zero. Okay. Mm. Uh, I guess they beat somebody else. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, but it's I mean, okay. you know, but when you're equipped five goals to zero, it tells mm. you how bad Ghana really was. Yeah. Really, really All bad. Around. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, the Public Accounts Committee, they've been sitting today and uh, the CEO of Cocoa Board and his team appeared uh, before them. And amongst others, they've been raising concerns about a recent documentary put together by Al Jazeera purported to expose um, child labor on Ghana's cocoa farms. According to Mr. Edu, the documentary was stage managed and does not reflect what happens in the country. Reports from our investigation um, has indicated that uh, it was uh, wrongly reported. Uh, the whole incident was stage managed. Uh, apparently, you know, the reporter went to this village in the western region and then, you know, organized the community from a church service. They were even in a church service on Sunday, took them to the farm and then directed what they should do, including a four year old child to be picking cocoa pots. It came up ordinary. No Ghanaian, no Ghanaian, you know, what uh, his or her thought will allow a four-year-old child to go and work on a cocoa farm. And this is exactly what, and also on a Sunday, this is exactly what Al Jazeera, you know, uh, broadcast to the whole world for a whole day on hourly basis. It's going to dent our image. But already there is serious concern about child labor in cocoa. Well, there's been reactions uh, from the Public Accounts Committee members. We can hear from Vice Chairman of the PAC, Samuel Tamils, and Deputy Ranking Member Davis and Sopoko. You go to any of these uh, fast food restaurants, you see 16-year-olds working over there. Is that child labor? Some of the big restaurants, they have them working as hostesses. Is that child labor? What about the 10-year-old or 11, 12-year-old in the Western world who distributes newspapers? Is that child labor? Don't you see some of these farms where you can see a 10-year-old or 11, 12-year-old riding a tractor on those farms? Is that child labor? Those who distribute milk are doorsteps. Look, we shouldn't define it just because of the race of the person. It is about time that we spoke up. What is this story about child labor? Just because you want cheap cocoa products, you label as child labor. It's about time we told them the truth. And it's about time we told them we are tired of this. Chief, I am suggesting that Cocoa Board take steps to report this matter to Al Jazeera. Probably maybe bringing in the Ministry of Information. Let's escalate this matter because for me, it is not just about Cocoa Board. They are attacking Ghana and, and it's something that we all must be involved. So let's escalate it at the governmental level. They are code of ethics is very clear once we have evidence that they came and stage managed this 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 act they are going to retract and they are going to apologize to country ghana i think we need to do that and that's our show for tonight up next is the geek squad guess what we are talking about how can employees avoid data breaches at work hmm. that's a very good important one. I want you to want to join to them for that for conversation it. my name is evans Mensah. i am mfr Paul. have a good evening